Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to the best thriller writers in the world. Now, while I don't put myself in that category of the best, I've certainly got my hat now in the ring. And after nearly three years of hosting this podcast, I think it's time to toot my own horn, if you will. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale all this month. It stars Detective Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat in Hollywood when one of the town's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home only hours hours after winning an Oscar. Beloved by her fans, Pat thinks someone wants this star dead and sees this as a way to forge her own path and get the promotion she craves. I'm proud of the response I've gotten from fans and I'm confident you're going to like The Poser. So for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only five bucks or the paperback for 14. Since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this as a way to help out a fellow thriller writer. There are two ways to reach the link. First, you can go to David Temple Books. Dot com. Scroll down to see The Poser. Click and you're on your way. Or head over to Amazon. You can find it there. Again, davidtemplebooks.com or Amazon. Thanks in advance for your support. And now, on with the show. If you're a fan of military thrillers, you no doubt have heard of Andrews Wilson. That's Brian Andrews and Jeff Wilson. Together, they're the authors of Tier One, Sons of Valor, and the Shepherd series. And their latest thriller, Dempsey, is available now. Let you and I get into the Thriller Zone and welcome Andrews Wilson. All right, well now, for those just joining us, uh, we were chatting in the green room before we all came live, and uh, I was just getting caught up, so I'm going to tee this up for uh, Jeff. And and we were talking about our first uh, jobs, our first really crazy jobs. Like, what did you do before you were the big, rich, famous author that you are, and you know, so forth? And uh, Jeff jumped right in. I, we're going to hold off on Brian's until Jeff's done. But Jeff, tell us this. You actually, we were talking about hot air ballooning. And, yeah. and Brian was saying, oh, oh, yeah, Jeff, he loves hot air balloon. I'm like, really? Oh, my God, that's so cool because they're really it's huge out here in San Diego. And Jeff said you painted it a little differently than it happened. What really happened was the two of you were mocking me, but that's OK. <laughs> that's OK. You were mocking me about <laughs> being a hot air balloon aficionado and a hot air balloonist, a hot air balloonist. And by coincidence, um, as you know, I'm a pilot and used to do that for a living. And in the early days of my flying career, I was dirt poor, like most pilots. So this was before I went into the military and I was working as a contract pilot and um, didn't have a lot of money for rent, didn't have a good place to live. And this guy had an operation, a, um, it was an air show pilot. He had a PT-17 in his hangar and all these balloons and he ran hot air balloon flights daily. And he told us, me and my roommate uh, at the time, Bill, he said, you guys can move into my hangar for free if you'll crew the hot air balloon trips in the morning, which is like, as you know, because it's big operations out there where you are. That's a sunrise thing, right? When the sun first comes up. So we lived in his hangar. We had access to a shower. We had electricity. And in exchange, we had to crew these balloon rides every single morning. We launched the balloons. We were in the chase vehicle. We had to load them back on and bring them back. So, yeah. not the wor- and By the way, not the worst job I've ever had by any stretch of imagination. It sounds like hella fun if you ask me. Yeah, it was, it was kind of cool. Yeah. Except we had to then, after we were done... We had to go fly all day, so we didn't get to participate in the celebratory champagne, which is the tradition, as you know, for hot air balloon flights. So we had to abstain from the from the uh, champagne toasts because we had to go fly afterwards. And everybody knows that Daddy likes his uh, beverages. <laughs> <laughs> the, the problem with uh, working with Jeff is anytime I try to tease him and I try to come up with something random like, oh, yeah, back when he was the hot air balloonist, you know, and he's like, actually, <laughs> you know, be like you know, yeah, that's back when Jeff was a hobo riding on those trains. Actually, I did use. Funny like, you should trains. bring that up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Brian, I can't finish this story, and we'll get into we'll get into the important stuff. You know, things like Dempsey and so forth. But come on, tell us your most. Let's go with most obscure, off the beaten path. People would go, <laughs> you what kind of a job? I mean, I guess uh, maybe it's, it's maybe something you wouldn't think of that I had done, which is I used to run psychology experiments at Vanderbilt in the in the cognitive psychology lab, and so we would get um, 
you know, you could get credits or you could get paid a few bucks. You know, if you're an undergrad and you agree to participate in these studies, they would give you, you know, some incentive, you know, like little incentive pay or maybe like extra credit in a class or something like that. And so, you know, I would have to set up the computer and have the person sit there and, and tell them what they're going to do on the experiment. And, and then I would administer the experiment and then collect the data and put it in, you know, to the statistics program. So that was kind of a strange thing. Actually, no. <laughs> I was waiting for something that involved, you know, hallucinogenic products that maybe added part of the testing. Yeah. Do you remember in Ghostbusters when Bill Murray is like running that experiment? Oh, he's zapping the... He has the card. He's like, guess what's on this card? And the, you know, and the guy's getting it right. He's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> All right. Welcome back to the show. Last time we chatted and I was trying to remember this talking this morning with Tammy. I'm like, when did the last time I saw these guys? And I'm like, we were sitting down having breakfast at Thriller Fest. This was like uh, last summer and it was so much fun and we we're getting caught up and you guys were right on the press with some really cool stuff going and then I wait, no, no, no. Uh, Brian and I, Brian co-hosted a pop and coast with Connor Sullivan mm -hmm. while Jeff was out hot air ballooning. Right. <laughs> I think, I, you know, I remember that now. I think while he was hobnobbing with you guys, I was doing all the work. Oh, <laughs> you see how that happened? <laughs> yeah, he had, time, he had time to turn that one around on us. I see that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, before we get to all the really fun, sexy stuff like Dempsey and so forth, which, wow, what a ride. What a friggin' ride. I'm just going to say that now and say the other heat when we get there. But let's talk about family biz, family stuff and, and just what life has been going on. We're going to save the big juicy news. We got a little piece of juicy news, which is not all that new, but it's new to my listeners and some people who have been living under a rock. But let's talk about just what have you been up to, like, since the holidays, et cetera, just to kind of, you know, just break the ice because you guys make me nervous. You're so intense. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, most of what we do is um, – sit at our computers because we have because we have to write four books a year. Um, but it's been it's already been a great year and we'll talk about some of the announcements later. For our family, it's just been, you know, business as usual. I'm writing and uh, they're going to school and Wendy's teaching and we're having we're having a blast. We did get a great family vacation to Jamaica. The the Jack and Emma, my middle kids, got certified in scuba last year. So we got to take them down and get them scuba diving in the in the beautiful waters there. And uh, it's been it's been good. So things are great in Tampa. Yeah. So I think for us, this was an interesting uh, holiday. My mother-in-law, she developed breast cancer and she lived in Florida and the hurricane hit and it cut out all the power in her building. So she had mapped out all her surgery and therapy and everything she was going to go through in Florida. And, um, you know, her building lost power. It's like, you know, her car was in the garage when, the, when it got flooded and stuff. So for us, it was just this whirlwind. Of, okay. Let's get her come to, to, to the house. She lived with us in our guest room. And, you know, my wife has just been uh, a superstar and we got her through all her treatment and she just left uh, yesterday. So to go back home. So she lived with us basically for almost five months She's cancer free uh, and she's a new woman. And so it was interesting when she left, um, you know, all of a sudden just that one less person in the house, it just seems different. It seems quieter. It just seems less, you know, um, yeah. we were all talking about, Oh, you know, now that Dee Dee's not here, cause she was always out there. We were playing games and stuff. And so it is interesting how the family dynamic does change just when one person comes or goes, you know, um, so yeah, that's that. that was and she's. I will say, I was. I had the opportunity. We went and did something with um, with Wilson Combat a week ago uh, in Arkansas, and I got to fly into Kansas and um, uh, drive down with Brian to the facility. And on the way back, I got to stay the night at his house before we flew to Virginia Beach to do some Navy stuff. And I, so I got to meet her. You know, I, I felt like I knew her because we've talked about her. I've actually spoken to her on the phone, and yep. she's like delightful. And she's like a thousand times even more delightful. Like we, we got in, we were bone tired. I don't think neither one of us was in the mood to socialize. It'd been a long couple of days. And 
Didi's breaking out the board games and we set up for, I don't know how long we played at this, these board games. She was so much fun. She's an awesome person. One of my favorite humans. Wow. Yeah. Family is everything in it, dude. It is. it is. Amen to that. And the older I get, the more I realize that, uh, it's, and, and just to go down a tangent, you know, we get all wrapped up in the business of all this stuff and the writing, the words and the making all the goals and the, but man, uh, having lost my mom, not that long ago. And now, and my dad's been gone for quite some time and then just lost another uncle and, and, and then my dog on top of it this year. So when you go through those one after another, you go, wow, it's, we're, it's just a blink, isn't it? I mean, yeah. And you just got to grab it, everything you got. That's yeah. the great thing about this job is we can do that. You know what I mean? Because yeah. we, we, we work hard, but we work for ourselves and we can, you know, Brian will pick up the slack so I can go do a cool vacation with the kids and I'll do some writing so he can go do things. He's got an exciting trip next summer. And um, that's another advantage also, not just of our business, but of being in business with your best friend. Like it's, yeah. you know, it's family when we're working, it's family when we're not, it's, it's, we're just richly blessed. It's an amazing yeah. life that we're getting to lead here. And I know it's like that for you too, David. Yeah. And, and for my listeners who think this is just a little bit of a, you know, love fest or whatever, I'm like, no, I've, I've hung out with you guys. And, you know, besides being the real, and I would say this, if you weren't here, you're two of the most genuine, nicest guys I've ever met just would give you the shirt off your back. And, um, I don't know, I, I don't want to get too geeked out, but I'm just so grateful for your friendship. Cause I think you're awesome gentlemen. Oh, well, thank you. We have plaques on the wall that we, which says that we're most genuine. <laughs> yes. Yeah, like, like, the, like the office, right? The best ball world's best boss. Right. Yeah. Same, same idea. All right, so let's do this. We're, again, I'm going to hold this off a second because, okay. um, and I and I wanted to let you guys know I really was working. This is going to seem kind of weird because the news that you're getting ready to share with my audience, uh, most of the world already knows. However, not everyone does, and I have listeners uh, and watchers, viewers joining me all the time. So this is going to be kind of brand new and new to some people. But on top of that, I had teed up. I was going to have a little surprise drop-in visit from our mutual friend, Tom Colgan. Ooh. However, this morning, he pinged me right before we all connected. And he said, dude, I am sick. I'm in bed. I've been in bed all night. I, it's not COVID, but I'm just, ugh, and I can't make it. I'm like, no worries. Get better. We'll we'll do it again soon. So, but Tom, in case you're wondering why I want to bring up Tom, the head honcho, king editor of all the world. God, I forgot his entire <laughs> title, but he's a big dog at the big house of publishing and um, editor for you guys and many, many of the biggies in the world. But he was going to, I just wanted him to like pop in and go, hey, got a little bit of news. And again, I know the book drops. <laughs> the 21st, but, um, go ahead and share with my audience, the huge news. Well, the huge news is that we're doing a book for Tom, but it's for one of the different series. It's not the same series we were doing before. We, he tapped us to write Jack Ryan senior, the Clancy book number 24. Bam. Yeah. Super exciting. I'll tell you, um, Mark Cameron has done such an amazing job and before him grainy and like everybody that's done this series has brought their own voice to it. So it's a little intimidating. First it's Clancy, right? And then on top of that, you have these heavy hitters that have, that have uh, gone before you, but uh, what an honor to do book 24, which will come out in, in 2024. And we're not going to give any spoilers to what we're writing, but I will tell you this, our book, the 24th book in that series is going to fall on the, 40th anniversary of the launch of the hunt for the red October. And so oh. we might be exploring some exciting ways to honor that huge anniversary uh, with this book. And I think, what do you think? We'll probably leave it at that. Right, Brian. I think that was the perfect teaser. <laughs> that is, you know, and now Jeff, will you have to give little extra notes to Brian to let him know kind of how that whole hunt for red October world works? Cause I mean, he doesn't, he's not, yeah, what is he? What is what does Brian know about submarines? Right. Well, what I told Jeff to get ready for this is that you know 
basically he needs to spend the next few months in his closet. So, (laughs) you know, put a little bed in there, um, have some other people have to be in there at the same time as you. So you get used to what it feels like to actually be underway. Now, in my defense, I have been on a submarine one time and um, I could not wait to get off of it. But mostly it was because of the submariners. Um, oh, what a jerk. <laughs> not because they're not great people, but they're very, they're very serious people. And they made us sit in their wardroom for like hours and hours. And I can't remember how long. It was like felt like a day. And they wouldn't let us move about the boat at all. And they're like, oh, you know, you're not, you're not, this is all classified stuff. I was like, well, I think we're, we're kind of classified people. And, but they, <laughs> so anyway, they, they were, uh, they took security very seriously as they should. I'm joking a little bit. I think it probably had something to do with these guys wanted to carry around their automatic weapons <laughs> in the nuclear engineering reactor spaces. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, not to be, not to sound like an idiot, but the, uh, and it, it's crazy because the very first thing I think of a sub and having watched movies about the sub and Tammy, Tammy and I share a little bit of this claustrophobia is a little being closed into a space that you, you can't really get out of like instantly are, are guys who get on subs. Uh, there, there can't be any guys who get on subs who go, Oh, uh, by the way, boss, I got a real problem with claustrophobia. Uh, I, we had one guy uh, who came on board. I don't really think he knew what he was getting into. So they do, um, you know, sort of like a basic psychological assessment before you're allowed into the community. But, uh, you know, I think you could lie or if you're not quite, on, you're, you, maybe you don't understand what you're getting into. It could be a shock. And we had, we just, just one person is all I can remember uh unless the guy that came on board and he was not so sure he said even before he went away i don't think i want to do this <laughs> and then when we got underway during our first dive with him on board he ran to the uh lower uh, hatch for the it goes up into the sail and he was trying to undo it and you know they did grab him and pull him down and and basically said guy uh you know, first of all, you know, if you open that, it's not going to be good for anybody. First, right? Of all. Uh, you know, <laughs> and where where do you think you're going? Like, do you, you think you're just going to go out and and swim away? You know, so he had to quickly get used to it. And I think this was maybe back in the days before the kinder, gentler Navy. I don't know if we have a kinder, gentler Navy today, but back then <laughs> it was sort of like, uh, you know, suck it up. We're all, yeah. we're all we're underway, and, and you're part of the crew. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that, uh, <clears throat> wow. Well, uh, evidently you never had a problem with that. No, what I like to say to people is, you know, you spend 95% of your day inside in whatever job it is that you do. Most of us are in our house or our office all day long. Only difference between that and being on summary is you just don't have the option to go outside. <laughs> yeah. It's an important option though. I would yeah. Say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's no going out for a smoke break. <laughs> Right. Exactly. I say I I do want to give one shout out here because, uh, again, we're not going to I'm just going to let everybody out there know there will be no spoilers about this book ever, um, because this is a this is a really exciting project for us. And I think that we do the readers a a disservice if we tease anything much than more than what we have. But but in a broad sense, I want to I want to give a shout out to a really cool dude. Uh, His name is uh, Ensign Andrew. Johnson, and he is uh, with Nav Info East, uh, which is the PAO office that coordinates with people like us that want to learn more about uh, the Navy and what's going on. And one thing that we wanted to do, and that Tom has been very supportive of from the very beginning, was we want to return to that route uh, that Clancy uh, put down, where his books always told not just the story of his characters but the story of America's military and its uh, covert operations forces in a way that's honest and real. And we wanted to return to that. And so we reached out to the Navy and said, look, we'd like, you know, we're doing this thing and we'd like to be able to talk to some people. And they have been amazing. So a huge shout out to Nav Info East and and, uh, AJ uh, in making connections, allowing us the opportunity to talk to subject matter experts in all aspects of Naval operations Uh, We want to show the world what today's Navy 
is doing and what they're capable of doing uh, to keep us safe. And, and man, we're just so blessed that the Navy has been so uh, gracious in accommodating that. Uh, so I think it would be unfair to not shout that out today. Fair enough. Excellent. Well done. You might have seen this uh, the last week. We've been posting, you know, videos and, and pictures from our trip on the USS Gerald Ford, which is the newest, uh, biggest and baddest class of aircraft carrier in the Navy. So we got to go underway uh, on the Ford for, for a night. We spent the time on the flight deck watching Hornet operations. And uh, it was just really, really, really incredible. And everyone on the Ford uh, was so kind and, and welcoming. Uh, we had a great stay. And, and it was really great to see all these young experts in their field, you know, and that the Ford is going to be deploying soon. So they're going to be on the front lines, the pointy tip of the spear out there like Jeff said, protecting the nation. So it was great to see these young professionals really at the top of their game, getting ready for this, this workup for this deployment. And that's the coolest part, isn't it, Brian? Like, and we remember this from our time as Naval officers, but also from our time as kids reading Clancy was, you know, seeing the technology and seeing the, the jets on and off the boat, seeing the new technology that went into this incredible aircraft carrier is cool but nothing is as impressive as those young men and women, 19, 20, 21 years old, out there 12 hours at a time doing flight deck operations, working hard. It makes you uh, optimistic for the future of our country to see these young men and women and what they're willing to do, the work they're willing to do, the sacrifices they're willing to make for our freedom. So uh, what an honor to, to be with those, with those kids. I, I don't say that in a way to insult them, but these are young people that are out there doing the bulk of the work. So really impressive, far more impressive than the ship were the men and women we got to talk to. Yeah. Um, what, how long is, you said it's a new, uh, and excuse my ignorance, I, I wasn't prepared for this, so I didn't do homework and drill down on it, but it's a, it's, so it's a new carrier. How long has that been in process of being complete? And only because I start geeking out on, man, what's something like that cost? How long does that take to build? You know, it takes decades to plan and then build. The Ford is the very first of this class. So she is the first deployable uh, ship in the new class of aircraft carriers. Uh, and it's, it's open source to talk about a little bit of the things that make it different. Uh, there's no more steam catapults. These are now, uh, their EMOL system is an electromagnetic system that launches these things with far greater precision uh, far better uh, at uh, getting the jet to exactly the speed she needs to be as she hits the bow of the boat uh, based on her weight and, and configuration and all that. Uh, the uh, advanced arresting gear for recovering aircraft, improved refueling system so that the flow of jets on and off this boat is well beyond anything, including the Nimitz class uh, carriers that we've ever seen in the Navy. It's incredible technology. Uh, that we got to see and be a part of while we were out there. Wow, that's amazing! I and I have been following some of your stuff on Twitter and <clears throat> watching little play by plays, and it's just amazing. One of the, my mo and we're going to get off of this in a second. One of my favorite things is when those when the jets come in and they get hooked on the what's it called when they the arresting cable. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that that is mind boggling to me to see that happen and and with such precision and stop on a dime blows my mind. Yeah, and that's that that when they do their trap, that arresting system has actually got some in, some intelligence to it. It can sort of detect the vector that the aircraft is landing on, and if if it looks like there might be an accident, it can change the tension on the wire to maybe redirect the aircraft, you know, away from going off the ship or into other aircraft on there. And you probably saw that they're doing takeoffs and landings at the same time. Yeah, you know? it's yeah. It blows my mind how to keep all that it, it, and this is horse uh, simultaneous horsepower it's crazy yeah 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 it's a wow. it's a really really impressive it's amazing to see yeah well and speaking of horsepower uh l let's just break out this little morsel thank you by the way to all the good folks at blackstone for getting me a copy okay guys let's take a short break and when we come back we'll find out what people are saying about dempsey stay with us the best thrillers, the thriller zone. And now back to the show.
Let's start with Don Bentley. He has a quote on here. And Don, as we all know, who is also carrying the torch, talking about a guy who puts the best blurb on the book. This says it all. This book is everything you want in a military thriller, action, suspense, intrigue, and heart. You can't say it better. And that does so sum it up. You guys have got to be mighty proud to see uh, this puppy hit the world. And, and, and as Don also says, hits like a sledgehammer. This one was, this one was a little longer in coming, as you know, um, one of the things we'll be grateful for is to not receive any more emails demanding to know when the next year one book is coming out <laughs> because it was two years, I, actually a little more than that. Uh, we had in the interim, we launched the Sons of Valor series. We launched the Shepherd series. Uh, we got contracted to write some techno thriller books that you guys were talking about earlier that's coming out later this year. So we were very busy. It wasn't like we weren't writing uh, for our fans, but uh, they did have to wait a little longer than usual on tier one. But I will say this is, and I maybe you always feel this way as a writer. This is my favorite tier one book mm -hmm. that we've written. We evolved Dempsey to a point where, Something new had to happen, and I think we delivered it in this book. Um, it was it's a was a joy to write. It was an opportunity to close so many different loops that were left open in the first uh, six books. Um, but we're really, really, really excited to see how the readers uh, feel about this one. Yeah, and I'll tell you the uh, I want to throw my own quote in here because the opening scene, and that's you know when you can grab the reader like you do on page one, that opening scene with kick-ass sniper Elizabeth Grimes is like an atomic onion. One layer explodes after another. <laughs> <clears throat> there you go. That's that's my I blew it all right there. Um, <laughs> The, no, uh, that's a cover blurb. Atomic Onion. This yeah. book gets you one layer at a time. That's right, baby. You can quote me at that. <laughs> it covers so many topics, as you said, Jeff, though, and it's, you know, so many layers. But can you do this for me? Because And it is, it's a hefty little read. I mean, it's knocking on 400's door. Can you give me a little elevator pitch that just kind of goes, bam? Yeah, I think that, you know, the title actually says it all. This yeah. is the self-titled Dempsey book. And it's really about, uh, if you're a fan of the series and you've read the first six books, you've seen there's been this evolution of John Dempsey from a door kicker to the world's most lethal operator, right? Uh, seal to spot really is his evolution. So that that this book is the culmination of everything that happened in the first six books because now we take Dempsey and we put him behind enemy lines in probably the most challenging environment imaginable to operate. And he has to do his mission all by himself. So it's, it's Dempsey against the world. So that's, that's the, if you actually want your elevator pitch, it's Dempsey against the world all by himself in this book. And that's what made my palm sweat constantly because you guys are all about teamwork. Everything about you is about yeah. teamwork and having your brother by your side and all of a sudden, I'm like, man, this guy is all alone, taking it all, learning this language, doing these, uh, going through these horrific scenarios. And I'm like, right up until the very end, when all, <laughs> which of course I won't mention, but holy moly. Um, <clears throat> here's one thing right here. And I don't know. I'm a fanatic for this, is why I, you know, do this so that I <laughs> highlight things because I, I know my mother, my mother would go, did you mark in that book, son? <laughs> You're defacing that book. Put a piece of paper in there. Don't mark on it. <laughs> she never sounded like so you, that a day. So you did month. both. I see. What? So you I did. I <laughs> <laughs> I highlight because there are certain things, and I, I and I told Meg Gardner this one time. I said, Mark, Meg, sometimes I just I'm reading your book, and I'm like, it's like you know, you can have a snack, or you can have a nice little lunch, or you can have a steak, where all you want to do is sit there and chew on that thing and really savor that with a nice little cabernet, uh, etc. And you just want to really chew on it. And I said, so what I do is I'll highlight these things because I'll come back later and I'll just go and I'll find a spot and I'll just read that again because it's so inspirational to me and challenges me to up my game. So um, these are compliments here, flowing gentlemen. But bear with me while I read this one thing because I love this. Dempsey's mind and body synchronized and he felt the shift. 
that acute state of hyper-awareness and connectedness when he entered that slipstream of combat where his perception of time and space changed. He felt the cadence of a conveyance and the rhythm of reactivity as Petrov's security team charged forward like a living organism, four in front, four in back, the head of the beast in the middle. <laughs> Come on, man. That stuff is good. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Dave, I'm glad you brought up the thing about uh, the team because it is something that we always hammer, right? The idea yep. that you, one guy can't drive a you know $10 billion submarine, one SEAL doesn't take that high-value target or take out bin Laden. And it's been part of the ethos of the Andrews and Wilson brand to honor that. And so on its face, it almost seems like this flies in the face of that. And what we noticed about Dempsey, what he did, I, I know I'm talking about him like he's a real person, but what, what he did, what he informed he us, as he we were true. writing this, subconsciously for both us and Dempsey, he did what Dempsey does. He formed a team around himself anyway. So, you know, I think that it was really interesting when we started talking about this, when we we're done with our rough draft and we started talking about that issue of team, we looked at the manuscript and it was like, well, it's all there. Dempsey did it for us. He knows that he can't do it by himself. And so that team ethos was one he created on the fly from the most unlikely of allies in the world. And so um, that's what I think is one of the most fun things about this particular outing with Dempsey is how he pulls. He uses those leadership skills as well as his operator skills. He's not a James Bond. He's a team guy and he builds a team around him to accomplish the mission. And there's a moment in the prison when all of a sudden, and I, and I stopped and I thought about this a second. I'm like, the guys who are not his friends, not necessarily his enemies, they are just happen to be alongside him. We'll leave it that way. And there's this subconscious thing that is happening. They're all kind of metaphorically standing a little taller, following rules yeah. a little bit differently to the organism that has created itself inside the system. And I thought, well, that's interesting. There's a guy who has leadership just woven through the fabric of who he is. And it challenges, even on a subconscious level, for those around him to follow in because they know somewhere uh, the animal brain knows that he's the leader of the pack. Yeah, he has a presence. And, and when he walks through a space, it's, it's almost like you remember in the movie Gladiator, you know, he shows up and he's sort of this outcast and midway through the movie all the other gladiators are basically bowing to him as he's walking through the you know the underground of the coliseum it's sort of like that with dempsey i mean when he shows up he is the one that is the most picked on and and has to bear all the brunt of of uh you know the informants and the and the and and, and the prison guards and, and everything and, and but just his character and his willpower wins people over and they recognize his integrity and they recognize his strength. And like you said, even, you know, Makarov, you know, like he's willing to follow Dempsey, which is yeah. crazy, right? Yeah. But that's just the force of will that the man has. And what's fun about Dempsey is he really is an amalgam of men like that, that Brian and I have known in real life and served with in real life. And what's fun about Dempsey that is definitely a mirror of those men is that, uh, and women too, for that matter, uh, is that they so often don't even know that about themselves. They, they capitalize on it. They work it into their system, but they don't sit and consciously know, well, I'm a great leader. They'll follow me. It's sure. just, there's not a real conscious awareness. And so what we had the opportunity to do in this book was to show that about Dempsey, but then also show that that is beginning to develop in his son. And I don't want to give anything away, but you do meet uh, his son, uh, Jake, again, and get to see where he is in his journey, because that's a question people have been emailing us about quite a bit. And so you'll see in this book, as, as Jake goes through his journey, his opportunity to prove the leadership that's innate in him, that just like his dad, he doesn't really fully appreciate or know uh, even it, that it's there, but it is. And it's so obvious to everyone around him. You just took the words right out of my mouth because I was getting ready to say, I had a question about a particular element and I'm going to be as surreptitious in uh, avoiding uh, as possible. I had this very specific question and I'm like, 
how do I ask that specific? And then you just said it. So we can talk a little bit further off camera, but as we start to wrap because of stack schedules, I want to say this. Uh, I was trolling, I was trolling through y'all's website this morning and I clicked to your film TV page because I know you guys are stacked. That's, you know, and I want to be super respectful of your time, but if, if folks, if you just want to see how busy these guys are, go to uh, Andrews hyphen Wilson.com and then go to slash TV film. I think it is or film and TV. So you guys are talking to, let me rattle this off because I used to work in Hollywood. So this really is impressive to me if I may geek out for a second. So we're talking to Skydance, Picture Start, Imagine, Sony, Fifth Season, Endeavor Content, Hutcher Parker, uh, Hutch Parker rather, and Cross Pictures. And there are uh, no roughly about a dozen projects in any one form of uh, <laughs> in process. And I'm just like, first of all, Holy moly. Second <laughs> of all, my question is this, after all that, um, between Tier 1, Sons of Valor, uh, Shepherd Series, Web Griffin, uh, and now the Tom Clancy stratosphere, I, I walk away going, how in the wide world of thrillers did these guys ha manage such a prolific stack of content? And this isn't blowing, you know, heat up your skirt because I, I know the discipline it takes and maybe therein lies part of the equation, but the, the discipline, I mean, and this on top of running two families, I mean, how, how do you guys do it in a year? Seriously, give Five us your secret. A day. That's right. Five pages. It sounds so stupid, but about a year ago, Jeff was like, dude, we probably should say to, to get all this done, we at least have to have a minimum benchmark for what we're gonna do every day, just for accountability purposes. He's like, why don't we try for five pages a day? It's like, I don't know if we can do five pages a day each. And that's each, uh, but we do. And that's our benchmark. So if you think about that, that's 25 pages each, that's 50 pages a week. It works out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you're a writer, Dave, so you know that you know five pages on, we well, are in act three of your novel, five pages a day is like, easy day like anybody could do it right because you have all that angular momentum and um you you have days where you write 12 when you write 14 not every day they're unusual days but they sure happen but for every day like that you also have a day where you work really hard to get three pages yeah it's three good pages but early in a in a project that's what you can do and so that commitment because of our obligations to say no matter what your day is done when you've done five um each has really been a game changer for us. And it doesn't have to be five pages in the novel in progress because now we've got, as you were pointing out, we've got treatments that we're writing, we're writing shorts, we're writing, um, you know, one pages and stuff for all these other deals we have. That gets to count, but you got to do five. You got to do five every day uh, each. And if we do that, it allows us to do what you're talking about, have some weekend time with our family, be able to go to church, be able to have a family dinner and that sort of thing. And if we don't commit to it, then it bleeds into the weekend and we're asking our families to make pretty big sacrifices we don't want them to make. So sounds simple, but it isn't always that simple in application. But the idea of it is pretty simple and we make it work. You know, my dad used to have this great quote. I've quoted it my entire life. He says, son, if you aim at nothing, you're going to hit it every time. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And it sounds so simplistic and yet it's exactly what you're saying. And I have, I have found, and I'm only nine books in, and this is all self-publishing, what I call practice before I really launch. But I said to myself, I was going to get 10 books underneath my belt before I said, okay, now, now that I've worked all my kinks out and I figured it'll take me about 10 years, that's okay. I got the time. I got other things to do that at that time, if I, if I build in the time and build my discipline in route, then when it comes to the time to deliver that point where I think, okay, now I've worked out my kinks and I've learned from guys like you and I've taken the courses and gone to the conventions, et cetera, then I can say with all confidence and I've put in the discipline, now it's my time. And it also triggers probably what you guys are because you guys are super disciplined guys. I mean, you grew up that way. You went into the military that way. And now in this uh, second, third chapter of your life, you're doing it again. And it goes back to discipline. So I love that. And I appreciate that, Jeff. Five pages. That's it. It 
sounds simple in one sense, but you're talking about quality pages. You're not talking about just filling words and like, oh, well, here's a half-ass idea. I'll just ramble on about that. And so, awesome. Insert comments here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, just any any aspiring authors that are listening to the podcast or anybody that's struggling, you know, on their second or third or fourth book, you know, don't be afraid to just give yourself that daily page count goal. Because I think, you know, even if you don't hit it, if you got three or four uh, that day, it might be two more than you would have gotten otherwise, right? So you take your your dad's advice, David, and then you say, okay, now how do we how do we Anders and Wilsonize it? Okay, that's that's kind of where we're at with 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 our method. And also, I guess, you know, when you do exceed your targets, like Jeff said, when you have your 12 or 13 or 14 page day, now suddenly you say, okay, uh, I'm ahead. What can I do to fill in uh, the, the time that I bought back? And, and that allows you to maybe be creative. And, and we, we, we say sometimes we'll take time away and we'll say, we're going to write a short story. And that's how those film and television projects came to be. It's because we say, you know what, we're going to take one week away from whatever book we're working on and we're each going to write a short story. That's two more pieces of IP that we didn't have before that we generate in one week. So always be thinking about ways to create more IP for yourself as an author besides just the one thing you're working on right now. And can I jump in here a second? And I don't yeah. want to toot my horn because it's all, I try to always make this about your horn tooting. However, and, and it, cause you made just a superb point, Brian. And my wife will often ask me, you know, when I start, I start my day about five o'clock and she'll come through and, and she'll go, Oh, how's the book coming? I'm like, it's good. Other days I'll go, I took a break on that book to carve out, we call it people magazine moments. I'll take a, an hour or two. And I'm like, I had this idea of this floating idea that came out of nowhere and I'll take, and I'll just drill down on that and I'll beat out uh, a, a rough outline of it. Yeah. And I might spend that into a short story and it might take all life its own. And then I'll just put it away so that I don't get distracted. All I'm doing is I'm changing channels in my brain because I've learned that if I do that, I'm just exercising a different muscle. Then I come back and sometimes I'll gain a fresher perspective over here yeah. and it has unlocked. It's it's kind of like when you're driving a car and you know that you're focusing on driving and you know that you have to hit this road to that exit and so forth. So you that part of your brain's gone. But man, uh, I do some of my best writing when I'm driving because it allows that other sphere of my brain to just go, oh, what about this? And I hadn't thought about that. And he, what if he did this, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you have that other story that's rattling around back there, eventually that itch becomes so big that you can't do the work you need to do be, unless you scratch it. And so taking an hour to just get a little bit of it on a piece of paper, even handwritten, uh, you know, outline like you're talking about makes a difference. And the other thing I'll say about the five page method that is a benefit that you don't see coming. Yeah, you know, we all know those days where you had this huge 12 or 15 page day because you're in the climax. But I've had these days since we started doing this where I hit three pages. And if we didn't have this rule that I have to tell Brian how many pages I wrote and I want to be able to say five, I have those days where I'm like, I'm spent. I'm done. There's nothing there. There's nothing in the tank. I'm going to stop. But because I know I have to do five, I'll force myself to write. And sometimes those days are eight page days because forcing myself to write one more page is just the fuel I need that I yeah. go, oh my gosh, wait a minute, look where it's going. And I turn around and I wrote five more pages. And so I've got a total of eight. So it's just really a tool to discipline yourself to put in the work. You'll have days where you force yourself and those pages aren't your best pages, but at least there's something you can edit. But for every day like that, there's two or three where I write way past goal just because I forced myself to make it to that five pages. Yeah. I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole. However, I'm going to say this. I, I would love, God, I would love to spend like an afternoon in the same room with you guys. There in Hollywood is called, you know, writer's room. So they'll get together and they'll throw her. I was talking to Joey Hartstone, who's now the EP and showrunner for Your Honor on Showtime. And he was talking about this in the way that, you know, you'll come in, sometimes people will be flatlining a little bit and you'll come in, you'll, you'll have a spark of an idea and you'll drop it in the room and they're like, oh yeah. And then boom, 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 boom. And they're like little fireworks, it'll take off. And with you guys, 
I don't want to belabor this. I'm not going to drill down on how do you guys do that? How do you write over here? And how do you write over here? And how do you make it come together? But I would love, I don't know why I did that voice all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> Unless that was Brian, right? You were imitating Brian. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, I always wonder how, you know, if you're going to, you know, maybe Jeff's got an idea that the Dempsey should be doing this. And I know you guys, you know, have a Bible that fits the whole world together, but, and then, uh, and then all of a sudden Brian goes, well, maybe he should go down this path. So, but I would love to, I'd love to watch how that happens and how you guys hopscotch back and forth and, you know, maybe how you bring it together. But we'll, we'll talk about that another time because I know we got to wrap unless you have a thought that you just want to interject real quick. Well, I just think it's a, it's a really good point, but it's actually the way we write novels and it's the only way we know we've been in the writer's room for eight years um, yeah. because that is our technique. It's anytime you're unsure, you get on the phone. We talk four or five times a day when we have a Got work it. in progress. It is like, it's all the benefits of a writer's room. Brian will drop this little thing. You know, I was thinking about, and it'll go boom. And I'm like, your first thing is like, what does that have to do with anything? And then two seconds later, you're like, oh, no, wait. Yeah, because that makes this thing that I was struggling with work. And then if we do this, we do this. So that writer's room thing is real. It's the advantage of being a co-author team. And it's something that we put to use four or five times a day, every single day of our life. Wow. You know, I studied at uh, the Groundlings in Hollywood when I was out there on my first tour of duty. And um, one thing I learned, and I learned it instantly, and it's a great little thing that everybody can use in everything in life. And it's called the yes and method. So if the three of us are in a scene and I'm like, oh my God, where did this, uh, where did this pickle with a gun in his hand come from? You guys would go, oh, that's right. There's the, I've been looking for that, right? So you're yes and, and you move it forward. If, but if, if Jeff, for instance, say, that doesn't look like a pickle. I think that's a banana or, you know, that's whatever that is. I don't want to go off that. The thing is, if you stop it, then you stop the momentum. However, if you go, yes, and oh, the banana is going to be perfect for here. Then you keep that room going like that. And in stand up and, or improv, Groundlings being an improv group, it teaches you to keep the room spinning, so to speak, and the momentum going. Yeah, yeah and I think I think that's something that we do, and we maybe, maybe never talked about it in that way. But I think that that's an important part of our method: is that instead of shutting the other guy's idea down when you hear something, you say, "Okay," and we could do this. You know, that's sort of our yes, and we say, "And we could do this, or this could happen, yeah. or this could happen." So every new idea is just an opportunity. And then the other thing we do, I think that, you know, maybe other writers have trouble with, but I think if you're going to co-author, be in a writer's room, you need to be able to come to grips with this. It's just have the, you know, the security or the self-confidence to say, if the other guy's like, eh, I don't know if that works or, you know, why do you want to do that? Just be comfortable playing devil's advocate and being able to hash it out. And it's not about being right. It's just about finding the best direction for the story so yeah. you know we'll do that too we'll say well let's for the sake of playing devil's advocate if we did that it would cause this this and this yeah but then this this and this and so we always come to a, we don't ever hang up the phone well i would say <laughs> every once in a while we, we we leave an item unresolved but most of the time by the time we've hashed it out we each have our marching orders and we're comfortable with yeah yeah this is we've solved that dilemma and now we can go right and that's part of that five page count, right? Like the phone call is not to just like muddy up the waters and get the other guy confused. So he can't work too. It's to resolve that issue. And then you both get back to work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when Jeff said that, uh, yeah, well, what does that have to do with anything? And made me think of that. But in reality, if you're like, oh, it might not have anything to do with that at that moment or in your mind at that moment, but you may go, oh, you know what Brian said earlier? That it always that goes really somewhere. It always yeah. goes somewhere. Even when you're like, I don't know, I'm not pretty sure I don't like that at all. It may not even go where that the first guy suggested, but it I can't think of a time where it didn't take us somewhere that was a better place than where yeah. we started. So you gotta you gotta let your ego down and you've got to be open and you know, you also gotta be able to say, Well, I don't like it, and here's why I don't like it. Yeah. Because that's just as productive because they're like, Yeah, but if we do that, so maybe we change it to this, and then that resolves this problem. And then you have a solution to the problem that gives you a plot point you never would have thought of. Yeah. yeah. That's so good. Well, and I feel, you know, I always wrap every show with that. Uh, what's your best piece of writing advice? You guys have been on at least two, three times now. And so I, 
I, you know, I, I feel like you've already done a lot of that already, but is there anything specific outside of that? Because I've been getting a lot of email lately going, oh, dude, thank you so much for that very last thing that you do in your show. It's so cool. You ask these guys who are the hitters going, what's your best piece of advice? And they're all sitting there jotting these things down because let's face it, you guys have, you know, forged the the road ahead of us. So if you have something to add to that outside of that, and I'm not talking about necessarily pure technique, but just something yeah. you go, you know what, here's a good takeaway you could have. Yeah, I got one. Um, and, and that's this. And it's sort of related to what we were just talking about. If you keep your mind open to trying these new things, even if at, at first they seem like maybe they're not going to work, some of the time it's going to take you to a great place. But remind yourself that if it doesn't, that's okay. All writing is rewriting. It's okay to be open to try something. And if it doesn't work, it's delete, 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 and you go in a new direction. But you yeah. still open some avenues that wouldn't have been open to you to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that one. I mean, that's our guiding principle. And I would say, if I had to come up with something new that we haven't said on the show, um, how about this one? A lot of times we'll do this where we get, if we get stuck on something, we'll say, well, uh, we don't necessarily want the readers to have to suspend their disbelief. Uh, so this doesn't make sense. We'll go back and forth. And invariably the solution is we put it into the book. So what I mean by that is if there's a question that we have, something that we are uncertain about, we'll make the character ask the question, right? So that way, instead of the reader suspending their disbelief, the character suspending is, is making himself or herself say, why would this happen? What would happen? And now it's in the thread of the book. And so there is no suspend your disbelief. It's part of the narrative now. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so clever. So good. So solid. All people right. Do that one once or twice every book. Yeah. Yeah. People are gonna people are gonna say, oh, that couldn't happen. Well, we'll just have Dempsey say that couldn't happen and provide the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like it. Well, folks, uh, once again, as you know, the book is called Dempsey. It's a tier one thriller and it's the latest and it's hot. And you guys, man, first of all, a uh, real quick thing. You want to learn more, go to andrews-wilson.com and dig it out there. But you guys, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. I know your your slate is full. And so uh, I know we had a little bit of a hitch in the giddy up at the beginning, but thank you for bearing with that and uh, making it all happen. Anytime, David, anytime. Yeah, we're going to be on Reddit. Uh, so the, we're doing an Ask Me Anything on Reddit. So pop on over there on Wednesday, the 22nd. I don't know when this episode's going to air, if it's after that. Then you can always go back and there'll still be a lot of threads with questions and stuff that you, you'll see will have answered many people's questions about all the work that we're doing, our military service and the like. So. Here's the beautiful thing. This is uh, we're recording this on Monday, the 20th. The book drops Tuesday, the 21st. This will air on Wednesday, the 22nd. Perfect then. And I'm going to admit my ignorance right here. I know what uh, uh, Reddit is as far as going to get information, kind of like a big talk forum, but I, I've never spent much time <laughs> on it because it feels like yet another rabbit hole. The ultimate rabbit hole. This one's just going to be an Anders and Wilson rabbit hole. So. Dude, like I need another rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, guys. Enjoyed it. Thanks, man. Once again, a great big thanks to Brian and Jeff, Andrews Wilson, and their book, Dempsey. It is a killer book. You're going to love it. All right, kids, can you believe we're already kicking off March next week? Seems like just yesterday I was starting my New Year's resolutions. Read more books. No kidding. All right, William Landay is my next guest as we kick off the month of March. All that is mine, I carry with me. Folks, I got to tell you something right here, straight up. Serious as a heart attack. One of the best books I have read since I began this show. You're not going to believe it. Book number four? What? Yes. New York Times bestseller Bill Landay is going to be on the show as we kick off March. And yes, we have a killer March lineup for you. Uh, I can't mention the names yet, but uh, Inside Scoop, April, May, June. We're already got three big heavy hitters, bam, and uh, some uh, new up and coming authors. Some people I'm very excited for you to meet. Some of these people I've been following for a while. Anyway, those details are to come, folks. Thank you so much for making this one of the fastest growing podcasts in the world. I couldn't do it without you. 
I'm David Temple, your host. I'll see you next time for another edition of The Thriller Zone. Papa.